Hello and welcome to another video. Uh, my name is Will and in this video um, I'm going to be giving a little bit of an introduction to types in computer programming languages. Now I've called this what are you talking about because I want to suggest that we already have a little bit of a sense of what types are because we need to know what we're talking about. So for instance some actions I'm going to say only make sense on certain types of data. And I'm going to start with some sums. So what's one plus one? Well, hopefully that one is straightforward and we can decide, yep, one plus one is two. But what's red plus green? Well, OK, in this sense, you know, we might think, OK, red and green, if I mix those two colours together as light, I might get yellow. Um, if I did it with paints, I'd get a muddy brown. And so, you know, already there's a little bit of a difference between if I'm talking about numbers versus lights versus, well, lights versus paints. Um, OK, let's keep going. What about, what if I said red plus a rabbit? Mm, all right, maybe that's a red rabbit. Uh, let's think of another one that doesn't make so much sense. What if I said a uh, rabbit plus rabbit? Um, well, OK, OK, maybe that is lots of baby rabbits. Um, but what if I said one plus red? What would I do with that? Um, you know, would I, do I want the next colour along from red? Do I want to ascribe a number to red and then add that to one? What do I want to do with it? What does one plus red mean? Um, what about one plus a rabbit? Um, again, I mean, it sort of looks like the sort of thing you might see in a, in a, in a puzzle. Is the rabbit a placeholder for some other thing? Um, so some of the things that we say, some operations that we might talk about, they only make sense to certain kinds of things. Um, occasionally, we can also get in a situation where we're ambiguous about what we mean. All right, here is one plus one, but instead of writing the digits one, I've got them as strings. Now, when I say one plus one like this, do I mean two or do I mean I want to stick the strings together and have one one? Well, so even in natural language, it makes sense to us, I think, that some operations, well, they only make sense on certain types of thing. And other times, operations mean different things when applied to different types of things. And other times, we've got these situations where it could be ambiguous what we mean by that operation, depending on what we're talking about. So we've also got this situation in programming languages, but in programming languages, we can't really be ambiguous. We can't have it turn out one way one day and some other way the next. It needs to mean something that is so interpretable that a computer can understand it. And so programming languages to do this, they tend to formally specify a type system. And so that means that you can also get things like type errors when you try to apply an operation to a type that it is not valid for. And there is type checking, which is the process by which programming environments check to see if there's type errors or the, you know, the, their process of validating the type safety uh, of this program. OK, now there's a couple of different kinds of language. Let me start off by talking about the kind that we're not using. So statically typed languages. Now, the source code that you write, uh, if you're writing in JavaScript, is still really designed to be written and read by humans. Um, it's going to get interpreted into machine instructions by the interpreter, and the machine instructions are going to be what the computer's actually going to do. Um, but so whatever language you're working in, somehow it has to translate it from these letters on a keyboard that you have typed into the instructions that the computer actually follows. In statically typed languages, there's a program that does some of this, that reads your program ahead of time and converts it into some other form. This is called a compiler. And so if I was to show you something in the Scala language, actually, this is one called Dotty. Um, the, um, this, this code here, this is not JavaScript. This is Scala. And so I've said I've got a program. And the main thing I want this program to do is to print out Hello World. Um, now, that doesn't immediately run. If I want to run that, well, I kind of need to compile it. And so if I go compile, it will go and compile and work out whether that is uh, whether that is going to work. And then if I want to run it, uh, well, now that will run it and print out Hello World. 
Um, but so this means suppose I was to insert a type error. Suppose I was to say that I have a, a variable, Scala uses var for, for variable, uh, that is called i. And I'm going to say that i is an integer and I'm going to give it the value 3. And then I'm going to say, well, now I want to reassign i to be the string hello world. And now let me see if I can. So let's clear that and let's actually do run, which is going to make the, the system. It's going to try and compile it and then build it for me. Um, but so we should see that what ends up happening is, uh oh, it has said type mismatch error. Uh, and it said that, uh, well, it found a string, but it required an int because I said that this variable was of type int. And so it hasn't run my program. And I can show that it hasn't run my program because in this case, I could go print learn of the program has started beforehand. And uh, well, if I went compile, first of all, the compiler would give that particular error. Um, and so there's, there, there is that error again. Uh, but also if I was to go, well, no, 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 I'm just going to say run. Uh, well, it's going to try and compile it first. It's going to come up with the error. And if I try and have a look for the program has started, I cannot see the program has started. This this program hasn't even begun. The compiler before I could even run this program at all has complained about my type error. And so that is errors being found at compile time. And it's also called static, uh, uh, statically, uh, statically typed language. Um, it's using, uh, you know, kind of static analysis where it's analyzing the source code to find the type error instead of the type error happening when the program runs. Um, let's move on to the kind that we are using. So dynamically typed languages, well, many of them don't have a compiler, many of, uh, or at least not of that sort. Many of them are initially interpreted, and so we can type things in and we can run it. Um, but dynamically typed languages, they check the values of types at runtime when we run the program. Um, so let me say over here, so let's create a type error. Let me go print learn. The program has started. Let me say that um, a is the number one. And then let me try and call a as if it was a function. It's not a function. It's it's a number. It's a number one. And now if I run that, I will see that it says the program has started before the type error happened. So it's not that there was a compile step first finding this. Instead, the error was found when my program was running, when it bumped into this line that tried to do something uh, invalid with a value that was of the wrong type. Uh, <clears throat> now, one of, one of the outcomes of this is that if you look at the, the, the statically uh, compiled language, the Scala, there is a type annotation on, on this variable. So this variable I have said is type of type int, and I can only assign an integer into that variable. Whereas in JavaScript, um, the variable doesn't have a type. I've assigned an int into that, but I could just as well reassign it to be the string hello world, and then ask it to print len of a, and the contents of uh, variable a would happily have changed. Now it's hello world. It was holding a number. Now it's holding a string. No problem at all. The variable doesn't have a type. Only the value that it can currently contains has a type. And it's when I try and do something with that value that is uh, that is this wrong, that, it, uh, that the operator doesn't apply to, uh, that I'll get my type error. Um, now, that has an upside and a downside. Um, these JavaScript programs, they are um, they, yeah, they're quite quick to get started with. Um, subtle errors won't necessarily stop your program from running. You can explore the parts of your program that are running. They're quite quick. You don't have to deal with this, uh, this messy business of dealing with compilers. Uh, on the other hand, once you get more experience as a programmer in industry later on, um, this does have the gotcha that it means that you won't know you've got a bug until you hit it. 
Lots of programmers actually like to find out they've got a bug as soon as possible because they don't want their bug to get out in the wild. They want their bug to be uh, neatly trapped on their computer where they can fix it rather than delivered to their customer and it suddenly breaks in some horrible way. Uh, so there are trade-offs between statically typed languages and dynamically typed languages. And the one we're using though to get started is JavaScript, which is a dynamically typed language. The next question that you've got, though, is what should your language do if it discovers a type discrepancy? And this is where languages can be strongly typed or they can be weakly typed. Now, if I go over to Scala and I was to ask it to print out uh, and let's just let's not even worry about variables. Let, let's just try and print out the expression one plus true. And let me try and run that. And so it's going to type check, you know, variables have types, but so do values. And so it's going to have a look and see if that operation can apply to those particular types of operator. And I get this slightly long winded error message, uh, but it is a type mismatch error. And I've sort of abbreviated it to say, look, none, none of the versions of the operator plus that I know about uh, will work with true something plus true isn't meaningful to me. I don't know what to do with that. And so I'm going to throw an error. Weakly type languages will often try to find some kind of type conversion so that they can satisfy the operation. And sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes it can produce some interesting behaviors. And so for instance, if I was to ask JavaScript, can you print out for me what one plus true is? And I was to run it, it would say one plus true is two. You might kind of think, really? Why is is one plus true two? How, how is true one? And it's because of a little bit of a convention that at least in JavaScript, if it wanted to convert true and false to a number, then true will convert to one and false will convert to zero. So if I was to go one plus false, I should find that actually I get one now. OK, so that is uh, JavaScript being weakly typed. And, you know, sometimes quite nice and fluid, um, but it can mean as a starter programmer that sometimes you'll see that errors will show up through your program behaving unexpectedly rather than a type error being thrown. Uh, so JavaScript will do its best to, to find a way of not throwing a type error. And so sometimes you'll be going, why did that print two? Uh, why did that print two? Uh, I said, I, I, I thought I had a Boolean there. Uh, and it's because it's converted it. All right, let's keep going. Um, now, if these things can get converted, then one of the gotchas that you can find uh, is that they can also get converted inside the condition of if statements. And so here, I'm going to say, let a equals false if a let's print learn but i thought a was false so far so good if i run that nothing happens it doesn't print it out a is false what if i'm not paying attention and just for a moment having a sleepy moment i put false in quotes it might be hard you know as you scan you see oh yep false to connect with the fact that false is sitting there in quotes. Uh, let's now run this. And it's printed out, but I thought A was false because the string false isn't false. The string false is what's called truthy. If it uh, is used in an if condition, then uh, a non-empty string will be treated by JavaScript as if it's true because for strings, truthiness is non-emptiness. And so now it has printed out, but I thought A was false. And it might just take me knowing that it does that sort of thing to realize that that's why it printed out, but I thought A was false. Um, so that's partly why I'm showing you these sorts of things, so that you'll be a little bit equipped because as a programmer, it's easy to make mistakes. You might see some strange behaviors go on. And so I'd like to give you a few uh, kind of hints in particular directions of some some, some common gotchas that you can you can come across uh, so that when behave th uh, things behave weirdly, you know, in the hope that um, uh, if you come across it, it'll, it'll help you. 
Uh, okay, let us try a few more of these on the next slide. Let us try um, uh, what things are truthy or uh, falsy. And to do this, I am going to create a function and let's call this truthy. Function truthy of A. And so let me say, if A, then I would like to return true. Otherwise, I would like to return false. Wouldn't normally do that because, you know, if this was a, a very strict language on its types, you'd think, well, hang on, you've got if. So if it's true, of course it's true. And if it's false, of course it's false. But in this case, we're going to go if and the thing converts to be truthy, then we're going to return true. Uh, so it, it's, it can be useful to do. So let me now print learn the truthiness of one. And so one comes out as true. One is truthy. If I do zero, false. So zero is falsy. What if I do 77? Well, let's try that. And 77 is true. Let's do minus 77. And that's true. So in numbers, numbers other than zero are truthy. Um, OK, what about strings? So we've done this one here where we did um, the string false. Uh, so non-empty strings uh, are truthy. So if I just, you know, change that to FE or whatever, uh, if it's not empty, it's going to be true. If I make that the empty string, though, it's false. Empty strings are falsy. What if I accidentally um, passed in a function, but I didn't put those parentheses? What if I accidentally passed the function itself? Well, functions, they're truthy. So that's going to come out as being true. And so that is one of these quite common gotchas. And I think we saw it um, uh, in, in one of the one of the things I sometimes show with Snowbot is uh, is I ask it, uh, you know, can go right if can go right. But I forget to put the parentheses on. And so instead, it's calling it passing the function, putting the function into the if instead of the result of the function into the if. And so then it doesn't behave as I was expecting because I was missing these two tiny characters that made the difference in what it was doing. Um, some other things that might be uh, that might be truthy or falsy. Let me do the truthiness of undefined. And so undefined is falsy. One of the things that means is if we don't pass a parameter, if we let a parameter default to undefined, then we should find it's falsy. So truthy there, what I've done is I've not passed anything for A. And so A is left with the value undefined. If undefined, well, undefined uh, is falsy. And so it's gone down this path and it's returned false. Um, same is true for the null value, if I was to do that one. Uh, that comes out false. Uh, same is true for the empty string that we've done. Um, objects tend to be truthy. Uh, we'll meet, not directly in this video, but we'll meet um, arrays. And arrays are truthy. And if I remove all the data, the empty array, uh, an array of no data, is still truthy. Uh, we'll also meet um, a data structure that JavaScript has called maps, which uh, let you say, look, I have um, this particular uh, this particular property and it has this particular value and if I pass an object like that uh, well that one also ends up being truthy and typically that includes the empty one empty objects are still truthy so that is the truthiness and falsiness of various different data types because it can be easy to end up with something in an if that you thought was a boolean and actually it wasn't uh, I mean, if nothing else here, I have written a function that takes a parameter. And as I've been writing this function, I mean, if you read that, you'd think, well, A is a Boolean, right? Because I've got an if statement. But A is not a Boolean. A is whatever is passed in as being A, and it might not be a Boolean. OK, let's keep on going. 
Uh, so because JavaScript is weakly typed, type conversions can give you some unexpected results. Uh, so we have already seen uh, if I do print learn of one plus true. Uh, and so that came out as being two. Um, some of these, you can play funny games where you uh, come up with things that will give you strange answers through a, through a type conversion. Um, let me show you a couple of, of kind of funny ones. Let's go um, the string zero plus the number zero. Which way is that going to go? Is it going to become a string? Is it going to become a number? Um, well, in this case, you get the string zero zero. So uh, the plus, it sees the string, it becomes string append, and it um, therefore converts the number zero into a string and sticks it on the end of the string. Um, if I was to go one minus one, uh, well, in this case, minus that that doesn't really exist you know it's it's not like plus is string append stick concatenate stick two string uh, strings together uh minus isn't and uh, so if i was to run this one uh, i'm going to get the number zero because to make the minus work well it's seen minus it's got a number on the right hand side well tell you what let us convert the string on the left into a number and then we can manage that and so then we get the number one minus the number one which gives us the number zero and we can also do things like, well, OK, let us try what happens if I go hello minus one. Um, and if I go hello minus one, well, actually, it behaves a bit differently. We end up with not a number. It can't work out a number for this. And so we get a result that, that is something that we will see shortly. It's a special number called not a number. I couldn't work out a number for that. Um, now, there's also, as I suggested before, uh, it penetrates all the way into um, functions. So if I was to say I'm going to declare a function add one that takes an argument x and I was to return x plus one, well let me go print learn of uh, add one of the number two, I should get the number three. Yep, I get the number three. If I clear that and instead add the, the string two, then if I run it, I now get to one because I have passed a string in here. Well, it's then seen string plus this. And so that plus is, you know, it's changed meaning by the fact that I've given it a different parameter. Instead of being addition of numbers, it's become a uh, concatenation of strings. OK, I think I've labored that point enough. Um, so JavaScript is um, it's weakly typed. Uh, it does these type conversions. It's dynamically typed as well. Uh, another something else you ought to know about it is that this does mean that it gains an extra equality operator. Uh, so if I was to ask it to uh, print out uh, is the string one equal to the number one, then it will say yes, it is because it can convert the string one into the number one and they would be equal. So if I use two equal signs, um, then that permits type conversions and they are equal. If I was to ask it, well, OK, instead, let me ask if the string one is not equal to the number one, uh, then that's going to say false. And it's going to say false because no, 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 I can type convert this into the number one and then they are equal. So not equals is false. Um, so that is the, the, the kind of like the two character equality, which is not strict equality. It permits type conversions. If instead I was to use three equal signs, this is strict equality. And this will not allow a type conversion when it does its checking. If the things are of different types, it will say, no, no, those are not the same. And so now if I print out the string one triple equals the number one, I get false. No, no, they are not strictly equal. Uh, and if I was to go not equal with, you know, exclamation mark equals equals, so still the three character version, uh, then I should get uh, true. That's correct. The string one is not strictly equal to the number one. Um, some other ones that it, it may be worth uh, knowing about. Uh, so there's a little bit of a subtle distinction that there, there's this value undefined and there's this value null. Uh, if I ask it is undefined double equals to null, I will find out that it is. Uh, but they are different types. I mean, they're similar concepts, but they are different types. 
And so if I go is undefined triple equals to null, uh, I will find false. No, 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 it's 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 not strictly equal to null because they are a different type. All right, let's keep going. So I've talked lots about these sorts of types. Let me talk about, you know, okay, but what types are there in JavaScript? And we're not going to go through all of them in this video, um, but I'll kind of give you a little bit of a, uh, of a list. So Booleans, we've already seen. So Booleans, we've got the value true or false, uh, but I'll show you a few more operations on that. Uh, numbers, I'll show you a little bit about how they're stored because JavaScript does something interesting with them in lots of languages. So for instance, in that... Um, Scala code that I showed you, when I declared a variable, I said var i int equals one. And so I'd said that not only is this a number, it's a whole number, it's an integer. And so lots of languages um, distinguish most of the time between things that are integers and things that have a decimal point, things that are not integers. JavaScript, generally speaking, you'll most of the time just be using the number type. And so this is one type that can hold a number like 12, that is a whole number or an integer, but it can also hold 123.4, something that's got a decimal. Uh, or it can also hold the number infinity, um, you know, the special number that represents infinity. Uh, so we'll see that in a little bit. Um, strings we'll talk more about next time, but strings are sequences of characters. So here is hello world. And they are encoded in a particular character set. So this is a way that these characters are encoded into binary so that they can be stored inside the computer. And the particular character set that uh, is used is UTF-16. Um, now, you might have come across ASCII, which is a fairly short um, 7 or 8-bit uh, way of converting a letter into a number. Same principle, but this is 16-bit. Um, so it, it, it's just a different character set, but 16-bits uh, lets it store a wider variety of characters. Um, there's quite a few different character sets in the world. UTF-8 is quite common as well. Um, there's other ones particular to Windows. There's quite a few different char character sets, but let's not go too much into those at the moment. Um, the thing that we're just going to know is that these strings are made up of characters like H and L and O and space. Um, objects. We'll talk a little bit about this. We're not going to go into full detail in this. Uh, JavaScript has a very unusual object system. Um, but so one of the things that we will find that is a little bit unusual about it is that um, functions and arrays can be treated like they're objects. But we will we will see that um, we will see that later on rather than in this video. And uh, we've already seen these two special values, undefined and null, that are their own type. Um, there is a little operator here, type of, that will tell you the type of a variable. So if I was to go um, print learn and I want to get the type of uh, undefined, let's clear that, let's run it, you get undefined. Uh, the mistake I almost made, I almost typed undefined in a string. And if I was to run that, well, no, no, that is a string because I put it in quotes. Um, so sometimes that can be useful to do. Uh, so let's keep going, though. Booleans. So we've got these values, true and false. I haven't really formally introduced you to various operators you can apply to them. Um, double ampersand is the logical and operator. So if I was to go println of true and true, then that would say that is true. If I was to say println of false and true, it would say false. If I was to do false, uh, true and false, it would say false. If I was to say false and false, uh, then it would say false. Uh, so this double ampersand is how you do logical and. I've put the logical in italics because there is also a bitwise and, which is a single ampersand. And it is occasionally easy to mix up the two. Uh, but so I just want to stress double ampersand is the logical the um, and operator, the one that uses uh, booleans. OK, next up, double pipe is the or operator. So if I was to go print learn false or false, um, then that should come out as being false. If I was to go false or true, then that should come out as being true. Uh, now, or in computing is inclusive or. 
Uh, so there's a bit of a joke uh, where you ask it, you know, you ask someone, would you like, would you like tea or coffee? And they take both. Um, silly joke about um, or tending to mean you know, inclusive or in programming languages, but often means exclusive or one or the other uh, in natural language. Uh, so if I go true or true with this double pipe uh, and I run it, you'll see that I, I, I get true. Um, exclamation mark is logical neg negation. So if I was to go print learn of not true, uh, then I would hope to get false. Uh, and there, there isn't an exclusive or, uh, but if you're sure that they're Booleans, then you can do things like um, not equals. So println true is not equal to true uh, should give me false. println true is not equal to false, uh, then that should give me true. println false is not equal to false, that should give me false. And so that can then give me the, um, the one or the other that it, it's only going to be true if this one is different than that one. Uh, I say if you're sure that they are um, Booleans, because of course we've got the problem that, well, what about uh, false is not equal to the empty string? Um, and that's false because false is equal to the empty string because it allowed a type conversion. And then we have to decide, well, well, okay, how do I want to treat that? Do I want to allow type conversions? Do I want to not allow type conversions? What do I want to do um, if the wrong th kind of thing comes into this expression? Um, though often in our JavaScript programs, we'll just write it so the wrong kind of thing doesn't come into this expression. And we'll go, no, 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 we are just dealing with Booleans here. And so uh, I'm just going to say false is not equal to false. OK, let's keep on going. Numbers. Now, this is where, um, as I'd already said, most languages treat integers, whole numbers, a bit differently than decimals, whereas JavaScript, generally speaking, uh, it treats them in this one number type. That particular type, it's not a unique type to JavaScript. The unique thing is that JavaScript tries to use it for most of its numbers. Um, the particular type is called double precision floating point, and it is a standard way of representing uh, numbers that could be decimals. Uh, now, we're not going to need to look into too much of the detail, but first of all, I want to show you a few things that you should know, and then I'm going to ramble into far too much detail and tell you lots of things that you really won't need to know for, uh, for this. Um, so floating point, that means a number where the decimal point could be anywhere. So here I've got four digits after the decimal point. Here I've only got two digits after the decimal point. So the, this is floating point because that decimal point can, you know, float along the number to be wherever we like it to be. As opposed to if I wanted to have a number that only ever had two digits after the decimal point, like I was doing an, an accounting ledger or something like that. Um, so floating point just means yeah we can have um, decimal points anywhere in, in, in our number. I've shown it in decimal, but really it means anywhere in our number in binary. Um, double precision is about the number of bits it uses. And so bits can be one or zero. Um, they're a thing that uh, inside the computer is sometimes called a flip-flop. It's a little thing that can sit in one state or the other state. And so that lets it store a one or a zero. And so that then, if you have lots of them, it lets you store numbers in binaries, collections of ones and zeros together. And so double precision means it uses 64 of these bits to store the number. And why double precision? Well, it's just that single precision was 32 bits. So 64 bits is double precision. Now, in terms of the format, the, the bit that I'd like to say about it is if you can imagine storing a number like 1,324, instead of storing it as 1,324, you ended up storing it as, well, it's positive, and it's 1.234 times 10 to the 3. So we've got a 1, and we've got these digits here. Uh, sorry, we, 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 we've got, you know, the, these are the digits of the number. And let's call that the mantissa. It's just a fancy name for the digits of the number. And we've got an exponent. Where do we want to put the decimal point? And so in this case, we want to put it, uh, you know, at the end, because you know, this is 1.234 times 10 to the 3. In this case, we've got something that is smaller than 1. And so in this case, we've still got the digits, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, but in this case, we're wanting to say that the decimal point is like times 10 to the minus 5. And so we've got this exponent that tells us where the decimal point is. 
And we've got this other little component, which is the sign, because maybe we have minus 0.0001234. And so that's like minus one. Uh, so there's a, a negative sign on it. And then the same digits and this exponent minus five to say that it's going to be, you know, shifted along that bit smaller than one. <clears throat> and so that's to say that these double precision floating point numbers, um, they have these three parts. They have the sign, whether it's positive or neg negative. They've got some digits that get called the, the mantissa and they've got an exponent, which is effectively where to put the decimal point. Now, let us delve into too much detail you don't need to know, um, because I've, I've shown this uh, to be meaningful with decimal points. Uh, but of course, they're actually stored in binary and they're in 64 bit. And that means they can look a little bit curious. Uh, so, for instance, this one here, this huge long thing, that is the number one. And it's got this sign bit and zero means it's positive. Uh, this bit here is the um, is the exponent. And this bit here uh, is the mantissa, the digits of the number. But it's it's stored in a slightly unique format uh, in these three parts. Um, but so then this bit pattern here, well, it's still positive and it's got a different exponent and uh, these digits. And that one turns out to be approximately 1.79 times 10 to the 308. So that's like 179 and then 306 zeros on the end. Um, this bit pattern here turns out to be an incredibly small number. It's 2.2 times 10 to the minus 308. So that is like point three hundred and seven zeros two two. Uh, really, really tiny. And you get a few other kind of unique things. I'll explain why this one is, is in a moment. But there's actually two versions of zero. Um, this one here is positive zero. Uh, this one here is negative zero. So this double precision floating point, if we look at it in binary, it's kind of more complex than we would necessarily want you to um, uh, to have all the details of in an intro programming course. But I, I, I thought it might be interesting for you to see it. Um, some special numbers, though, that it is worth remembering, it, which is why I was going to a little a bit of this detail. Um, what if I was to do print learn of one divided by zero? In lots of programming languages, this would be an error. You'd get a divide by zero uh, because it would go one is an integer and we divide it by zero. We should get infinity, but I can't store infinity as an integer error. Uh, in JavaScript, we go one divided by zero and we say, well, actually, that's infinity. So this double precision floating point, it has a special format that lets it store the number infinity. And that is a representation of infinity. Um, it has this positive and negative zero, um, though they are both equal and they both print out the same way. Let me do one divided by infinity. So I can type infinity as a number. And if I print out one divided by infinity, I get zero. If I get minus one divided by infinity, I get zero. Um, but the, this subtle thing is that I actually get negative zero. It remembers that it's negative. Uh, so let me show that this is uh, that it is remembering uh, that that is negative. So let me go. Let a is minus one divided by infinity. So this should end up at that zero, but it's going to be that negative zero. Let me print learn. A is and append on the end a. Let me then go. Let b is one divided by a. Now, if it's zero, one divided by zero should give me infinity. Let me go and print learn of b. Now, if I run this, I'll see that it says, yep, a is zero minus one divided by infinity. That is zero. But then when I divided one by a, it actually came out minus infinity. And that's because it's remembered that this isn't just zero, it's negative zero. And so one divided by negative zero is negative infinity. So that's just kind of a bit of a curiosity about it. Um, there is this special other one, which is called not a number. And so if I was to ask it to print learn zero divided by zero, which is one of these, you know, that, that that's just not defined what that is, um, then I will get this special value, not a number. And uh, not a number, it is actually, you know, if I, if I type it, N-A-N, 
uh, that is the number not a number. Uh, so I can I can go and use that in expressions, but if I add one to it, it'll still not be a number. And uh, so I'll get not a number. Okay, so these are a few special ones that you might come across that are kind of a result of this curious way of storing numbers in JavaScript um, that does exist in other languages. Other languages do have double precision floating point. Um, it's just not normally the first one you come across in other languages. However, there is a little bit of a snag. So if I can scroll back to here, I've got quite a lot of bits for storing the digits of the number but I don't have an infinite number of bits. And if I give it a long enough, big enough integer, they won't fit. And so in that case, it will what's called lose precision. And so uh, this is going to be the occasion when 52 bits aren't enough to hold the digit. So uh, generally that's uh, very large numbers. So I think uh, if I look it up and it's, um, uh, it, it, it's about that number. So it, that is, you know, that's um, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, about nine quadrillion. So some pretty big number um, that it's going to have issues with. Um, but if I was to, for instance, go print learn of nine, let's go, let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's put nine on that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And tell you what, let's do times another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, let's see if that's going to get too big for it. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, let's clear the console. There we go. So it's it's got to a stage that it's it's um, it, it's starting to print it out with these e pluses. Um, but if I was to replace some of those with Digit, so we, I mean, it's been able to do that one because that's only really got two digits in. It's 8.1 times something or other. Uh, so let me now replace those with some unique numbers of about the same length. And if I was to clear that and run that, um, oops, I shouldn't put a zero at the beginning of that. Sorry about that. That got it to be parsed differently. Uh, these digits times 10 to the 24, but actually there might be more digits than that in if I was to write that out longhand with all the zeros on the end, it may well be that there's there's more non-zero digits in it than that is showing me. And so it's lost precision and it's kind of become a little bit approximate rather than exact. Uh, if if the numbers are integers, though, there is this thing called big int. And so I can put an N on the end of these. And so then those numbers are going to be big int. And uh, let me see. If I run that, uh, well, sure enough, there were some extra digits off the end. You know, this one finished at that 98. Uh, I've actually got no 2994056. Um, OK, I mean, behind the scenes, this might be storing a few more digits. It's only printing out that many because it's in that double precision floating point. Um, but this version where I've taken the big ints because I put the ends on the end, um, that is going to hold a number that is an integer of arbitrary length. And it's because it's not constrained into those 64 bits. It will store it differently so it can store as many digits as it needs to store. Um, and so here I've then got a, um, well, let, let's do this one. Let's um, let's copy that, that expression. Uh, so this is going to come out as a really big one because there's lots of digits in there. And so let's clear the console and let's play that. And sure enough, here is a huge number with lots of digits that's way bigger than we could store in um, just 64, uh, uh, sorry, 52 um, bits for the digits. OK. One other thing that is a little bit weird that JavaScript does. Uh, I talked a moment ago about how double am uh, ampersand was by, uh, bo boolean, you know, logical and, but there's also single ampersand, which is bitwise and, and or. Um, in some of the other things I've taught, so for instance, in the circuits up uh, course, uh, you might see some stuff around bitwise operations, where we take, for instance, the number five, logic, uh, sorry, bitwise and, with the number 12, shown in hexadecimal as C, uh, produces the number four. Because if we go through these bits, in bit one, that one's a one and that one's a zero, but this is and, and so one and zero is zero. Uh, this one, zero and, uh, sorry, zero and zero gives us zero. One and one gives us one. Zero 
and 1 gives us a 0. And so 5 anded with 12 gives us this particular bit pattern, which is the number 4. Um, how are you going to do that if you're in this situation where actually your numbers look like this? I mean, this is the number 1. It's, it's not the bit pattern that you're expecting. And so there is a little bit of a weirdness that if you want to use the bitwise operators uh, and and or, then it will convert the number into a more regular 32 bit integer like other languages store it so that those bitwise operators will work, work out the result and then convert it back into its own number format. And so if I do print learn of uh, what was it? It was five bitwise and with 12, um, it should still manage to print out the right answer. So it's still printed out four, uh, which is what we had over on the right here, uh, even though uh, actually the numbers that it's storing internally look this strange format and it's not doing the, 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 the it, it's not storing the same sorts of bits as you would be expecting so it does the conversion uh, does the operation and then converts it back so that these kinds of bitwise operators can still work um, and so you've got um, that one there uh, sorry th this one was uh, bitwise and a single pipe is bitwise or and so in that case we get the, uh, 13 and uh, we've also got, we do now have a bitwise exclusive OR operator um, and that would happen to give you nine. We're not going to use these a lot, so I'm not going to, uh, not going to delve into these. We talk a bit more about them in, 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 in uh, the other course. And there is a bitwise negation. Um, so if I do tilde five, then it should turn it into a 32 bit uh, integer, invert all the bits, and then turn it back into a number, uh, and in that I get the number minus six, which might seem curious, um, but if you've done the other course and looked at two's complement, uh, it'll make sense why that's the uh, the, the the number minus six. Um, but so this is just to you know, so that those of you who've done that other course can understand what goes on and how JavaScript makes sure that those operators will still work, even though it's got this weird number format. Okay. I think that's quite long enough for one video. Um, this hasn't covered all of the types. We'll talk about things like arrays and maps and other kind of useful data structures that it's got uh, in another video. Uh, but for the moment, I'm going to say thank you for watching.